So tonight's uh, panel will be honoring the legacy of Dr. Bob Burns, as we knew him. He was known by different names. Some of you knew him as Rob, others Bob. I always called him Bob. Um, and we're continuing his legacy um, by thinking about global religions um, in our community. Religious studies at, at the University of Arizona, like other major universities, um, is an essential humanities discipline. There's few other topics that really get us at the heart of the human experience, few other things that have shaped uh, the hu humanity, culture, society, uh, than religion. Uh, so our students are able to study deeply, broadly and deeply, how religion has shaped uh, the human experience in the College of Humanities here through our Religious Studies program. And that's uh, the wonderful legacy of Bob Burns um, to the University of Arizona and the, the larger community. He was a professor of religious studies at U of A for 45 years, um, from 1971 to his retirement in 2016. He had a really amazing life, and many of you who are here um, know parts of these stories um, and have, have celebrated that life with us as, as he has re just recently passed away this June. Um, he was uh, someone who had both a personal and a professional connection to religion, which isn't always the case for those of us who study religion professionally. But at a young age, he had the opportunity to become a professional baseball player with the White Sox but instead chose to become a Catholic priest um, and was ordained in 1961. But even as a Catholic priest, he always had a driving passion for interreligious inter understanding. You can see the sense of shock in this headline from 1964 that a Catholic priest was going to be a Reformation Day speaker. <laughs> he uh, went to get his PhD uh, in, the, in the 1960s and decided to study Protestantism, not Catholicism, and became a scholar of, of Protestantism as part of his early efforts for interreligious sort of understanding. Um, this was a time when anti-Catholicism was rampant in the United States. This is the period when Protestants were shocked and horrified that John F. Kennedy was elected as the first Catholic president the only Catholic president until our current one, Joe Biden. Um, and I imagine that the sense of being misunderstood or maligned by a dominant religious majority shaped Bob Burns into someone who would dedicate his life uh, to interreligious understanding and diversity. He joined the faculty of the University of Arizona in 1971, soon after he finished his PhD, and launched the Religious Studies program here soon after. He was an enormously popular professor. We've estimated he taught maybe some 20,000 students in his 45 years here. Um, and he won uh, many teaching awards, the Five Star Faculty Award. You can see this clip from Tucson Magazine in June 1978. Uh, where he's listed as uh, among the 10 most popular university professors. Um, it says it's in alphabetical order, but I like it that he's number one there. <laughs> and uh, many uh, throughout Tucson, every, everywhere I go, if someone went to U of A during Bob's time here, there's a good chance they'll say, oh, you're in religious studies. I took a course with Professor Burns. He was amazing. So uh, we continue that legacy today. Uh, the many students he impacted and mentored and taught over the years. He was a fixture in the Tucson community, regularly giving uh, talks uh, throughout the community. And when I came to U of A in 2001, uh, the first semester I taught here was when 9-11 happened. And uh, he was really um, committed in the aftermath to making sure the community understood more about Islam and he was really instrumental in uh, making sure we had our first hire in Islamic studies soon after that, uh, which was Scott Lucas, who is on our panel tonight. Um, and his last book uh, was called Christianity, Islam, and the West as part of uh, his efforts to increase kind of community understanding about uh, religion and religious diversity and um, understanding our Muslim community here in Tucson and around the world. 
So today our religious studies uh, program is thriving. Um, we have eight um, tenure stream faculty members now specializing in a broad range of uh, areas from Native American religious traditions to Hinduism, uh, to history of Christianity, to religion, science, and medicine. We have a really amazing career track faculty who carry on that legacy of teaching thousands of students every year uh, in their religious studies courses. And uh, we continue to have partnerships all around the university because religious studies is so central to so many disciplines. Uh, we have 25 faculty affiliates from uh, from classics to Africana studies, Judaic studies, East Asian studies, the Center for Buddhist studies, Division for Late Medieval Reformation studies, Asian American studies, and so on. Um, so it's uh, really quite an amazing place to study religion here at the University of Arizona. And because we have such an interdisciplinary faculty, religious studies majors can uh, specialize in so many different areas of interest within religion, whether it's Asian religions, indigenous religions, we have a track on religious studies for health professionals. We have a lot of students who go on to med school. Um, I was speaking to one of our alumni tonight about how so many of our students have gone on to law school. Um, so we're, we're very fortunate to be able to offer such a robust education in religious studies here. And uh, we have alumni all over the world now in professions, um, every imaginable profession. Um, where, whether it's law or medicine, education, business, and more. Um, and we love hearing from our alumni. If you're an alumni watching tonight or here with us, please do reach out. We, we really love to connect with you. Okay, um, I am going to turn it over to our panelists uh, now, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves briefly. And we have a few areas we're going to discuss as a panel, and then we're going to turn it over to community discussion at the end. Start off our panel tonight, our conversation. I just thought I would ask all of you to introduce yourself to the audience and your area of specialization, um, and then we'll we'll get this conversation going. So, um, Alex, do you want to uh, get us started tonight? My name is Alex Nava. Um, and my field is religion in Latin America and religion in hip hop studies. Um, and I was a student of Bob, so I'm gonna talk about that, of course, in a bit. Hi, I'm Ray DeShiel. I am a professor of Buddhism in the Tibet and Nepal. And I was very fortunate to be hired in my first year here um, as a Burns Fellow. Hi everyone, I'm Caleb Simmons. Uh, I'm an associate professor of religious studies and had the, the great pleasure of, of working with Bob for several years. And I, I also have to say, I'm, I'm just delighted to see you all in person again, uh, to see so many familiar faces that over the eight years that I've been here uh, through our connection with Bob have, have been able to build community and, and come together and, and celebrate his legacy. Good evening, I'm Scott Lucas. I'm an associate professor of Islamic studies. Uh, when I was hired, maybe the third hire by Bob, um, I didn't realize I was number three, that's nice. Um, I was 49% in religious studies and 51% in a department called Near Eastern Studies, which is now called School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies. Uh, and so, but we've, we've had great relations um, with, with religious studies. It's been a joy being colleagues with everyone here. We had a, a bit of a hard time narrowing down the panel to just figure out who's going to be on the panel tonight. Because as you see, we have so many uh, people who, who do religion at U of A, um, but we've narrowed it down to people who were hired by Bob or um, were hired as a result of the Robert A. Burns Endowment Fund, uh, such as Ray being a, a Burns Fellow. Um, so maybe we could start by talking about Bob's legacy. Um, and you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how you were impacted by Bob's leadership and how you would describe his impact on the university and the larger community. Um, as I mentioned, I was a student of Bob Burns and he had a tremendous impact on my life. I, I stumbled into one of his classes. I was a pre-med student and I didn't grow up, I'm a first generation college graduate. I didn't grow up surrounded by books so I think he was the first to like expose me to the world of ideas. 
And I have to say that it was something like a revelation to me and an epiphany that it opened up this new world and it was rich with possibility and it kind of showed me a new way of being in the world. Um, and it was like discovering a, a new language or like discovering a new world itself, um, an undiscovered world where there's these like exotic curiosities and wonders. And he exposed me to all of that for the first time. And it wasn't only him and it wasn't only religious studies. I remember he introduced me to Heiko Obermann, the great Reformation scholar. So I was taking courses in history. Um, I ended up in courses in Greek philosophy um, with Julia Annis and Robert Gemello in Buddhism. Um, and even I remember... I, this class was actually more influential. I've been thinking about it lately. He was a professor in political science. He was, um, it was on Irish history, but he was one of the first to kind of expose me. His name was O'Neill to the notion of liberation theology, which was a movement that was arising out of the um, third world countries or uh, Latin America and Africa. And they were all really influential. So it was really about the humanities in a broad sense that, you know, for the first time, again, it was like I was filled with a sense of wonder and the joy of learning. I think he communicated to me for the first time. And I, I think, again, for him, the question of religion was like an essential part of the humanities. And it was like, what makes us human? And I think he was really good about like exploring the spiritual dimension through human cultures and different traditions and customs. And I think that's, that's not always the case in the study of religion. And we're going to talk about that later, but I, I think he was really good about showing why this mattered for your life. Like how this could, how these ideas can make you a better and more complete human being. That was what I think resonated with so many of his students of like making us more thoughtful, interesting, um, curious, compassionate human beings, like better people. <laughs> I, I think that was something that drove a lot of his, his teaching. And he, he appealed, of course, to both insiders of the religious traditions and outsiders. Um, it wasn't just one particular um, group. And he always did it, the last thing I'll say, um, he always did it with humor, like throughout all his classes. In fact, one anecdote, um, I went to visit him, and this was recently, this, I'm not talking about when I was a student. This was recently when he was um, at the retirement facility on River and his mind wasn't as strong as it used to be. His memory wasn't as strong and his body definitely wasn't as strong. And I was walking with him, pushing him in a wheelchair and a man walked by and said, oh, Bob, is this your son? And right away with a smile on his face, he said, I don't think so <laughs> but almost like i could be wrong but you know <laughs> so he still had that like sharp wit the irish wit and that was a huge like element in his teaching um his storytelling his jokes um and connecting with his students on a very human level thanks so much Thank you. That was a great segue because one of my strongest memories of Bob, uh, he used to teach a very popular class that went from Judaism to Christianity to Islam. And he was very humble. And once I guess I was hired, he would often invite me to come to the class and give a lecture. And he would usually say, you know, and he said this several semesters, you know, we do a survey at the beginning where people self-assess how much they know about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And he's like, so for Christianity, it's a seven, highly inflated. <laughs> Every year, highly inflated in a way that only a priest could say, you know, they don't really know anything about Christianity. Judaism, maybe three or four, and Islam, one, or even less than one. And he was like, and you know, this is why it's, it's so important. And I have to say, 
back when I was starting to work here. This was, as Karen mentioned, September 11th had happened. The U.S.-led invasion of Iraq had happened. It wasn't a great time to be teaching Islam necessarily, although there was a lot of interest, um, but not always for the right reasons. And it was a tricky time for, for being a Muslim as well. Uh, and so seeing someone who could both be clearly very committed to one religious tradition and also teach a variety of religions was extremely inspirational and and really helped make that transition from graduate student to fledgling professor a lot easier. Thanks so much. Um, just to follow up on uh, his humor, one thing that um, his students have often talked about an alum is how he um, was so committed to trying to present all the religions as objectively as possible. And one of his favorite stories, and the Monsignor told this at his funeral, to everyone's kind of shock and awe, but um, the, uh, the student came up to him at the end of the semester after his comparative religions course and said, Professor, I was just wondering, you teach all these religions. Do you have a particular religious preference? And Bob said, yeah, a little bit. I'm a Catholic priest. And <laughs> the student said, no shit. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, and <laughs> that's one of, that was always his favorite, that the students couldn't tell after, at the end of his comparative religions courses. So, um, you know, you've touched on some of this in the personal influence, but why do you, why do you think um, that Bob's legacy, um, the impact on U of A, what, why is it important at a land-grant secular public university like this to, to have these religious studies courses for, for our students in the larger community? Um, would one of you like to take that? Yeah, I'll jump in. Because um, I, 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 a lot of it I'll draw from personal experience that might mirror some of um, Bob's experiences, but from a radically different context. Um, I personally always went to uh, state schools um, and I, when I first, I, I grew up in, some of you have heard my personal biography, grew up in a, a very small rural uh, context in the panhandle of Florida. So all your Florida man stereotypes, that was, that was me. Um, and had a, a very narrow view of the world and view of religious traditions. And when I went to university, um, wound up taking something that I thought was going to be easy because I grew up in a religious household, so I'll take Introduction to World Religions. Um, and um, honestly, much like Alex experienced, it, it blew my mind, uh, because I just hearing an unbiased, impartial um, presentation of beliefs and practices that weren't aligned with my own um, really made me see the humanity uh, in other people that I had thought, you know, at that point, and uh, just people destined for hell. Um, and that was about it. Uh, and so, and while it seems like such a, a potentially small thing, uh, when we think, I think about it now, it actually is a, a radical experience of expanding uh, one's understanding of our neighbors, our community, just to be able to see that people born in a different context see the world differently, uh, see the cosmos differently. Um, and while we talk about why it's important in the state is because often this is going to be the one opportunity for students to hear that, uh, and they can go the rest of their life back in, in a community that might have a, a more singular view. And then you get wrapped in your own, uh, way of seeing things. And this is, this is that opportunity to show students that there's, there's more out there. People think differently and that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's additive. It's it's bringing it is, brings about variety, uh, which is a good thing. And so I think having that legacy here, founded on the idea of diversity, religious minorities, it, instructing people in the way other people view the world, uh, actually is you know creating a better world. And I don't I don't say that flippantly. I actually do think the work that we're doing helps make the world better. Do you like to? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I think also we face particular challenges um, at a public university to how we teach religion and the anxieties students have about learning about other religions. Um, so, you know, sometimes I encounter students who say, well, you know, religion is responsible for the worst atrocities that our world has seen. You know, religion is divisive. Um, and I think one of the really rewarding things in the gen ed classroom is seeing students start to break that down. So for example, um, 
in my Buddhism in Healing class, students recently came up with this, you know, proposal that I found really helpful. Like, you know, misogyny becomes Buddhist when, you know, karma is used to justify inequity, right? And so then suddenly we could use that formula and apply it to other situations to be like, you know, this kind of inequity becomes something religious when, you know, this religious principle is used to explain an inequity. Um, and so then it was no longer, well, this religion is misogynist or this religion is, you know, hateful in some way. But looking at, in a more complex and nuanced way at those power dynamics and how they work in a given situation. And then on the other side, you know, the reward of seeing where religions are used to bring about good also. So, you know, students seeing where, for example, in the contemporary world, Buddhism is being used as a resource for activism um, and also for activists who are trying to kind of refill the well and, you know, face seemingly impossible challenges um, by sustaining their bodies and minds through religious practice. So those are some of my thoughts. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, you all teach a, a wide range of different um, courses and, you know, talking about the power of studying religion at a, a land-grant institution like this to try to understand humanity or neighbors or community better. Um, what are some mis misperceptions about religions or the particular religions you specialize in that you come across often that, that you've been able to kind of help students get beyond um, or, or grapple with a little bit. And we'll start with our Islamic studies <laughs> professor. It's, it's interesting. I mean, when I started, I guess, the misperception was, of course, of Muslims all being violent and, and hating Americans because we're Americans and things like that, which I'm not sure how many of the students had, but now the students were born after September 11th that we have in the classroom. So it's a whole, you know, I, I used to be old talking about the Iranian revolution. That makes me look like a dinosaur, right? But like, even September 11th is something these, these kids didn't see, right? Or they were extremely small uh, when it happened. And so I think now I don't even know if they have misperceptions. Like, I'm not even sure they have perceptions. Um, and so it's, it's very exciting because there are a lot of Muslim students here. There, there, there's a mosque that's now surrounded by high-rise dorms, which has created a lot of interesting, unpleasant situations. But that's the reality. Uh, the, the Muslims got good real estate and they haven't sold it yet. Uh, so it's, it's there. And uh, so it's, there are Muslims around. There are a lot of Muslim students here. So I, I think it's beneficial for them to learn that. But I'm not even sure they have misperceptions at this point because unless you grow up with Muslims in your neighborhood, you might not really know anything at all about Islam in this country. So for this generation, the media hasn't necessarily been pounding that in as it might have been during the early 2000s or... I hope. Maybe I'm wishful thinking, no. but I, I hope... Thank you. And I, I'll jump in after that because I um, I teach two popular classes and one I kind of lean into misperception misperceptions. Um, it's the class I teach on the history of yoga, which was intentionally named just yoga. Um, so students, we get a lot of people fewer now, but used to show up with their yoga mats and their water bottles. Uh, and then they see a, a paunchy 40 year old in front of them and they think, what, where am I? Um, so it's, uh, and then using sort of that perception of this is what yoga is. And then we sort of do a shock to their system and jump back. And the first thing we read is just a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. So immediately there it's playing off of this, you know, what, what you think, you know, and what's comfortable uh, and using that to bridge to a, another world. But my the other class that I teach is for freshmen, and teaching freshmen is one of the most fulfilling experiences you can have in, in your whole life. They're bright-eyed, they're bushy-tailed, they're eager, um, they read, um, and so it's such, a, it's such a nice time. So the course that I teach is, is titled God's Goddesses and Demons, and then the subtitle drills it down a little bit more, Divinity in South Asia. And the students also were shocked with our first reading because we actually read Rudolf Otto's The Idea of the Holy. So a, a Lutheran theologian is the first thing we read to understand what, you know, perhaps we have as our baseline understanding of what divinity is or what the what holy is and then we jump into the south asian world and we talk about righteous demons 
uh, gods that are committing adultery and doing all these things to kind of try to take the received knowledge. You know, what you know is true. Gods are good. Demons are bad. And actually interrogate that. What what do these um, what do these concepts mean? Uh, how how are we applying them differently cross culturally? And we get into translation studies and things like that as well. But to be able to move people from what they feel they know very comfortably to something very very foreign and often you know as they see it as, as very exotic actually gives students the opportunity to to think more freely and try to become a little bit more agile in the, in the process. And by the end, what we find is some of the preconceptions, misconceptions, or just perceptions in general, um, they've actually for themselves been able to work through some of these things. And by the end that where they started with received knowledge and assumptions now by the end, they understand that a lot of this is contextually based. So it's, it's the power of a semester uh, that can really help move people into a, a new direction of thought. Either, either of you want to talk? Um, I think uh, that there's all these sorts of perceptions. Um, I think on the one hand, it's related to what I said about the kind of that Bob spoke to both insiders and outsiders of the religious traditions, which is tricky in a lot of ways, because on the one hand, there's misconceptions of religious studies is doctrinal, dogmatic, and um, people want to avoid it for, for those reasons. On the other hand, you have people that, the, that aren't familiar with religious traditions um, that or that are actually more of the insiders that think of religious studies um, as like all the professors are agnostic and atheist. Um, that's, there's that perception as well. So I think Bob was really good about challenging both <laughs> misconceptions. Um, I think he shows the possibilities, the richness, the, the, the resources of the variety of religious traditions. And, the way in which they critic are self-critical. And um, I think for him, one thing that I, I recall him to often talking about is the notion of, of faith, which is one of those terms that can be really misconstrued. And um, but I loved the way he distinguished it from belief, that he didn't think that they were synonymous, that he didn't think it was just about believing certain abstract propositions that makes one in this case, in certain cases, a Christian, for example. Um, but he thought that faith was actually synonymous with hope and love, and that it was particularly a particular way of life, a certain way that you live your life that revealed your faith, um, and that it wasn't about doctrinal like propositions. And so I, I think he was really always really good about challenging and unsettling, certainly challenging people on the other hand that um, that came into the classroom thinking that, you know, that religion is certainly just affiliated or so in solidarity with the right wing. I mean, he would unsettle those um, perspectives. And he was really good about just challenging um, anybody who was a little too self-satisfied in their belief. Yeah, I like I like that. And I think, you know, that's something that we all strive to do as humanities professors, whatever the topic, just kind of always kind of get get in there and shift the thinking just a little bit, just shake up anything that's a little too stuck in a rut and 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 oversimplified. Um, just one brief example I'll give for one of my courses. I taught uh, for many years um, a course called Women in Christianity that's um, cross-listed with gender and women's studies. And um, there are students who will enroll in it with the religious studies prefix and students who enroll in the gender and women's studies prefix. And this one semester, they were all going around talking about what they had learned from the course so far. And um, and a lot of the students, you know, it's kind of a stereotype too, but, you know, there's some students from the gender and women's studies prefix that just wanted to learn about how Christianity was just bad for you know, women. And, and in my, all of our courses, I think we try to show sort of the, the broad range of possibilities and realities and all of these things and the complexities and the, the double-edged swords. And um, so 
the gender, some of the gender women studies students said, well, I've started to learn that Christianity is more complex than I thought it was when it comes to the history of gender. And, and then the religious studies students were saying, well, I was really worried about studying with these gender and women's studies students, but they, they, I'm actually learning a lot about gender, you know, gender and women's studies is not that bad and really actually kind of interesting. And so it's kind of nice to see both ways, you know, they're kind of shaking, shaking up their, their perceptions of what the course was going to be. Um, but I think any course that is able to kind of shake up students' preconceptions, whatever they are when they, when they arrive, is, is a successful course in, in our humanities curriculum. Um, so in, in talking about um, the theme of, of this uh, Tucson Humanities Festival, um, and you've, some of you have alluded to it um, more, I mean, how, how can uh, religious studies and learning about religious diversity, how, how does that help us think more deeply about the concept of community? Um, how, how can that bring meaning to our, our festival for this conversation today? So, I mean, Bob's legacy obviously speaks to community. From a Buddhist perspective, one of the core practices of Tonglen is uh, exchanging self for other. You work on widening your um, kind of circle of care, right? So starting with the people that are most immediate and then, you know, working gradually through the neutral and the more challenging individuals. And, you know, education is basically that right? is like you start with your position and what you're familiar with, and then you start learning about other perspectives. Um, so I think Bob's legacy speaks to that. And also from a Buddhist perspective, you know, the three jewels of Buddhism are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the teacher, the teachings, and the Buddhist community. Um, and in my Buddhism in Healing class, you know, I tell this story like on the first day, even though it's kind of very sad, but it really speaks to community. So um, there was a woman, Kisa Gotami, who lost her child and she brought the child to the Buddha and said, will you please revive my child for me? And the Buddha said, okay, I'll make you a deal. I want you to go to the door of everyone in this village and if you can find one household that has not suffered loss, then I will bring your child back to life. Right? So, of course, Kisa Gotemi goes from door to door and she doesn't find a single household that hasn't suffered a loss. Right? So then she comes back to the Buddha and says, okay, I get it. Right? What do I do now? And she becomes one of the first Buddhist women. So there are poems written by this group of women, many of whom who have lost children, actually. Um, so, you know, one definition of what community is, is a community of, you know, people who have suffered. Um, there are also more optimistic definitions. Community, from a Buddhist perspective, is also, you know, that we all have in common the fact that all we want is to be happy, right? Everyone has that in common. So there are different ways of coming at it, but community is absolutely at the center of the study of Buddhism. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Uh, and, you know, both Ray and I uh, study uh, Asian religion, so there's a, there's some overlap. But one thing that we talk about it in my classes quite often are uh, reflections about identity um, and how we we formulate who we are um, and thinking about, you know, one from like as we're teaching what community means. And I always reflect on this time I was in India and trying to you know position myself within the community that I that I was living and um they were trying to figure out who I was. And of course, my primary identity markers at the time were graduate students and, you know, um, Floridian, like all these things that really don't mean that much to the community. Um, and then I eventually found out what they were getting at because uh, then they, they wanted to know my religious identity. Uh, and eventually I, you know, it's complicated, you know, and so I, I would, I came up with this, this formula that I would tell them. And I was, you know, really proud of myself for uh, for uh, you know coming to this, and basically I said you have a family deity and a chosen deity. I said my family deity is Jesus, my chosen deity is the goddess I do research on, um, and they didn't they didn't really care. They were trying to figure out what I could eat, um, and so your dietary restrictions are, are based on on your religious identity. Um, but I, I tell that story because um, our relationships in the community that we form in, in our own religious traditions or whatever is a meaningful community for you, it, it winds up, it's who you are uh, and you're embedded within that. And in some ways, when you're teaching religion, your course becomes a microcosm of that uh, because, you know, you, you do group work and you talk about 
ideas like suffering. You talk about, about ideas like hope. Uh, and through these discussions, students start to build a bond. And again, I look around the room. What's uniting all of us? Of course, it's it's Father Bob, but it's not a, a vertical relationship with him. It's also horizontal. Look at the relationships that you formed with this community uh, and how strong it is and how we see each other uh, repeatedly. And we, we've grown this relationship. And this is this is what we can do. Talking about deep, meaningful subjects is we build our own community. And it doesn't have to be really just studies, but I do think this is um, a subject matter that lends itself to deep connections very quickly. And I, that's so great. And I just want to jump in and say um, hello to my students who may be watching this on live stream. But you're part of this community too now, even if you didn't know Bob Burns by studying religion, um, you're entering into this conversation and this community and, and part of this legacy. Um, and, you know, we hope you're having some of these kind of amazing experiences that, that we've had and that, you know, um, that Bob's legacy will continue on for generations into your generation and beyond um, as, as we're able to study these really meaningful and powerful topics. Um, do you want to say a little bit about community too, uh, the c community here in Tucson? And sure. Um, so when I first came here, there was one uh, Sunni mosque or sort of mainline mosque, and it was right on campus, which was very convenient. Um, now we have three, uh, so the the community has grown a lot, and some of these families send their children to the U of A because it's convenient and in state tuition, perhaps, or it's, it's a great university too. Uh, and so it's, it's wonderful seeing some of the students come through our classes that we also see in the community. And I imagine that's in other faith traditions as well here. Um, so that's, that's great. And then a lot of our students come from different countries around the, the world, right? There are dozens of countries uh, where Muslims live. According to Google, one in four human beings is a Muslim. So that's kind of exciting. Um, that's according to Google. I, I don't know if that's correct or not, but they have a lot of researchers. Um, so it, I, one of the things we try to do in our classes, too, is to expand people from thinking that their country is the only sort of normal Muslim country and the rest are weird or do strange things. And to try to, you know, I'm no expert in Indonesia or South Asia, but there are twice as many Muslims in India as in Egypt. Now, which country do we think of first when we think about Islam? We probably think of Egypt and certainly Egyptians think of Egypt, right? They don't think, oh, we should know, figure out what's going on in India to know how Islam is practiced, right? That's, that's unheard of. Uh, so that th there is that great opportunity. I would just stress too that, you know, often when you're in a Muslim community, if you, when you do interfaith or things like that, you get one day with an hour maybe to kind of try to explain your whole religion. Whereas it's such a privilege to have 15, 16 weeks, it could be 14, but 15 or 16 weeks, right, with these students. And they can just learn so much uh, in that time period. So that's just something that's great too about being part of this. And I also want to give a shout out to our Judaic Studies program as well. And I, I think so, some of our colleagues in Judaic Studies, there's a religious studies uh, degree and program. And then there's a whole separate Judaic Studies program and Center for Judaic Studies here at the University of Arizona. Um, and we, we've always had this long, close relationship. Bob Burns was very close with um, Ed Wright and David Graceboard and Beth Nakai and um, others in the program. Um, and we've continued that relationship. Um, so it's also a a very welcoming and, and exciting place to study Judaism as well. And um, we have students who want to study both Judaism and uh, the broader religions. So they'll double major in Judaic studies and religious studies. We have students who will double major in religious studies and minas and special, you know, focus on Islam. Um, the biggest part of our Buddhist studies program is in the East Asian studies department. Ray has half her line in religious studies, half in East Asian studies. And so we have a lot of double majors that'll do Buddhism, both in the East Asian studies program and religious studies. So um, we have many different communities um, here uh, on campus for studying uh, major religions. Well, maybe I'll uh, wrap up our discussion and um, with a final uh, question and then open it up for any Q&A people would like. Um, and then beyond that, we can continue conversation more casually over, over the dessert menu. Um, so we, uh, you know, we, we're, talk we're talking about community as kind of a, a important large concept, but beyond um, community, um, what, what are some of the big issues or big questions that the study of religion can help students uh, engage with in meaningful ways and, and the larger community? 
um, who would like to start? So Alex, would you like to, maybe you could all briefly comment on that for our final round. I'm always been, I'm very interested in the big questions for, for the religious traditions. Um, and for me, I think one of the things, again, that Bob like introduced me to, um, I remember there was um, a reverend, a preacher, a black preacher, Reverend El Elwood McDowell, who who's still here in, in Tucson and still has his church. And um, they became really close friends. And he was just, he loved going to preach at Elwood's church. And he would often tell stories, the energy of the interaction, the call and response of being in a black church. So I remember that it really opened me up to like being really much more interested and curious about learning more about black history. And I have to say that that was, I mean, I grew up um, fascinated by hip hop. And um, so when I came here, I, I thought there were classes on jazz and rock and roll, but there was nothing on, on hip hop. Hip hop is a complex phenomenon, as, as AP um, RD knows. It's just multifaceted. There's the poetry, the music, the dance, the art of DJing and the production side and the, the, the graffiti writing. And of course, the social issues, the issues of human rights and justice. And, and I think that Bob planted that seed in me, the, the wanting, believing that if religion has any value, it has to be engaging in issues of human rights and justice um, beyond our shores. And uh, I think that he planted that scene. He didn't get the hip hop thing. <laughs> I remember when I told him I first wanted, to, Bob, I want to teach a class on religion and hip hop. Hip, what? <laughs> like, what? Like he didn't, uh, it was the different generation. And he really um, didn't understand it. And I remember the day that I told him actually, because of, that he was, had come back and he was, he had a remarkable impact on so many students, thousands and thousands throughout the years. But he also had, there were limits, even with a great teacher like, like Bob. And I remember because he came back from a class and he was kind of discouraged and, and, um, he got through to so many people, including a lot of athletes that Marisol would funnel him, many of the athletes to, to his class. And he really, he was a former baseball player and he, he connected with a lot of them. But one he could not get through is Rob Gronkowski. The, the, he's, if you don't know, he's probably the, like the best tight end in NFL history. And he would just like, listen to his music and he, Bob would get so frustrated with him. And, but he, Bob told me it was a lesson in humility. <laughs> There's a limit of what you could do as a teacher. You have to be at a certain level. Um, but I, but I remember that, uh, of course, that being baffled by the question of, of hip hop, but, but ultimately totally supporting it. When I give him the spiel about, that I think it's about like of being a voice of the voiceless, that hip hop was giving the mics to marginalized communities and letting them speak and tell their stories. And he got that and was, was very supportive. So I think one of the big questions for students is how do I bring what I'm doing in the classroom out into the world? So that's something that we're dealing with all of the time. Um, but I think another big question that we take on is why is happiness, from a Buddhist perspective at least, not possible if others are suffering? So the ramifications of this are kind of using your mind to understand why you don't do good things, you don't help people because you should, right? You do it because it actually makes sense right? <laughs> because of interdependence and so forth. Um, so, so thinking philosophically about that and then thinking about how to bring that into your own life. Um, and another big question just very quickly is what makes land sacred? 
right? To who and why? Um, and so, you know, is it natural resources? Is it religious beliefs? Is it cultural history? Is it identity? These are questions that we're running up against all of the time now. And so those are some of the big questions that we're grappling with in my class. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, and for me, and I, I think a lot of this has to do with my own background and my own positionality and something that's been increasingly, I think, on all of our minds that I try to get to in my courses now is about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, thinking about systems of power and hierarchies. And, you know, for students who are not as open to the idea. It's I have the luxury of of teaching about another culture, uh, and so sometimes it's very hard to to show someone them, themselves in the mirror from day one. But in like my course on yoga, for instance, it's actually one of the primary themes of the course. Uh, and you go and think yoga isn't it about peace and being real flexible? Um, well, yeah, but it's also like any other human institution, is built into systems of hierarchy and power. And so we spend the, the first part of the semester, you know, looking at power structures in the Bhagavad Gita and in classical texts and thinking about caste and gender discrimination in ancient India. And then all of a sudden we hit colonialism. Uh, and then now all of a sudden they have the vocabulary to understand structural inequities. Um, which before they may have had a knee-jerk reaction against, but now have prepared themselves to start thinking about, you know, what was it when colonial powers went and started to establish these, these rules and changing societies? And then the last module, we come to, to the U.S., uh, and then it's time, but they've been slowly walked into this. So it's something, again, that we can do when we take this history of religions approach is we can take things that we want our students and just society in general to be thinking about and grappling with, but we can ease them into the conversation in a way that might be more productive uh, for people who, if you were to turn on NPR and say, listen to the story, may have immediately been, you know, whatever, um, you know, pejorative they, they would say at the moment, but now actually have the tools to be able to, to have that conversation and start to also then understand that this is something that's part of, of life. There are structural inequities and these things were made, they're in religious traditions, but they're made by people. Uh, and where there's people, there's going to be people who want to have power structures. Um, and now we can have a different conversation moving forward, hopefully for the rest of our lives, because we've empowered the the tools to have the conversation. And religious studies is a great way to start that because people have strong opinions. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the challenges of teaching religious studies is that you're not teaching religion, at least in a public university. Right. So I can't make my students fast for a month. I'd probably get fired. And that, that's OK. I understand why I would. But like so you can't really have them maybe experience what makes your religion or the religion you're teaching that. So, however, the life of the mind is something valued in the university, if maybe not enough other places where the life of the mind is valued. And so one of the, the privileges of teaching Islam is to try to show that there are actual Muslim thinkers who might not necessarily jive with what you're thinking you're not thinking but they're not influenced or sometimes they're influenced by ancient greeks and all that's pretty interesting too but they have their own sort of universe of thoughts and ideas and complex issues they're dealing with whether it's free will and determinism whether it's the political regime and they have their own way of doing it that doesn't depend upon necessarily uh, european thought or american thought it, it has its own way and, and that's something that once again in a 16-week course uh, because it's 16 weeks, you can actually introduce them to a wide variety of thinkers. Obviously, in the modern period, then you can see them collide, right? Where now Muslims are speaking in a very similar language, and then it gets much easier for a lot of the students to understand, because now they're speaking and using concepts. They're dealing with things like democracy or human rights and things, because everybody's talking about that in, in the post-colonial period. Um, but there is that sort of opportunity for the pre-sort of colonial period where you can really show that, look, people around the world were thinking really complex ideas, and, and that's, that's one of the joys of teaching this. Just one thing I'll, I'll say, and then we want to hear your thoughts and input and questions as well. Um, and I've um, said a little bit of this to my um, class today that, um, especially in the last you know couple of weeks with everything happening at U of A, thinking a lot about 
all the, the resources of the world for thinking about suffering or death or tragedy. And, you know, that's one of the big questions in the study of religion, thinking about all the different ways communities have come together to grapple with the human condition and with, with the reality of suffering, with the reality of mortality, um, and just all the rich resources around the world for how, how communities have done that throughout time and space. Um, so that's something um, that I find really meaningful right now about religious studies. Mm -hmm.